Thank you. The last time I spoke in Munich was 1994 to a huge convention organized by an organization called IFRA, which is now called One IFRA. And it didn't go well because they asked me to talk about color. And I said to the audience, huge audience, I mean, I think there were about a thousand people there. It was a huge convention and trade show. I said to them, don't use color. <laughs> or if you use it, use it very sparingly in information graphics. It so happened that while I was in Munich, I went to a art gallery just close by, and, <clears throat> and I saw the Munk painting, and I felt like that during and after the talk. And I, uh, it went on actually for quite a long time. But today, 22 years later, I know it's going to be different because uh, apparently Germany is the best place in the world and remarkably, you mess about with your snow. This is uh, Philip Messner who actually sprays the snow blue, which is my favorite color. And so that endears me to come and to speak to you today. But most of all, it's going to be okay because of, of this man who you just heard. And thank you for inviting me, Michael. You are a great friend now. And the exhibition that you put together is, uh, I'm very honored to, to, to be part of it. However, I'm not sure that I'm thanking you for the title that you've given me, because uh, I don't think that I can actually tell you what the meaning and the function of this is in society today and tomorrow in, in 30 minutes. But a very brief background. Um, I don't know how many people put their hands up when Michael asked if they'd heard about information graphics in 1991. I thought, 1991? I mean, how old are you, Michael? I mean, like 12 or something? 1991. I was just about to leave time. Anyway, brief background. I got this atlas as a child, and you'll see this a few times in, in my talk this morning, and it taught me a whole lot of things, and actually I used the atlas for a little bit too long in my professional life as well, because I liked it so much. I liked the design of it, and uh, I could look at it and imagine all sorts of things going on in England where I grew up, and I loved the kind of iconic and black uh, figures all around it. And I live here in Hull, just right here. And, uh, or just outside Hull, actually. And so this was a big in influence on my life, this little atlas. Uh, I always looked at this uh, piece of work, which is um, the Prime Minister of England at the time, Pitt and uh, Napoleon carving up the world. And this gave me permission, I felt, to bend and manipulate things, whether or not that might have been uh, a map of England. This is something that I did for the Radio Times uh, in 1976 with a great art director and another mentor called David Driver, who went on to be the art director of the uh, London Times and left when Murdoch bought it, uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, but I moved to America, and I continue to bend things. I realize now this was about health costs and inflation and car losses. And I, I, this approach at time upset a lot of um, academic people, uh, notably this piece. Uh, and, um, but actually, 
plenty of the graphics that I did at time were actually quite straightforward. Uh, and you know, it's very easy to criticize the ones that maybe uh, offend your sense of uh, trivializing information. I was never trying to trivialize information. I was trying to make it accessible to people. But I think the main question that we should be asking about information graphic is, who is it for? Who is the audience? Who is the reader? Who is the user? Is it for children? Is it for people who are just skimming through in an airline magazine? This is for uh, United Airlines. Is it for people who are looking for what's allowed abroad in the sexual realm? Should it be sober and dense? I did this just after a terrible thing happened in America, the Columbine shooting. Should it be very simple? This was an app that I designed for the Billion People um, app. Uh, here are all the icons that I, I, I did for that. They had to be simple because I had very little time and uh, not only where they had to be simple to be seen on the uh, on the application on on the mobile phone, but also because I didn't have long to do them. Is it for readers who know the subject pretty well? This is for Stanford Magazine about nanoscale systems, in which you can go a little deeper into the subject. Should it be in two languages? This was for a small uh, folded up document for um, uh, warning uh, young women at the time, but also young men, about cervical cancer. How far should the scientific explanation go when it's actually a fairly light piece? This is for Die Zeitung magazine. Uh, and outside you can actually see what they did with it. Uh, this is what I sent them uh, in, in English. Uh, is it for a a uh, psychologist's textbook. This is the most used piece of work that I've, that I've ever done. This was, again, for Stanford Magazine. I get, I had another one this morning, requests about every uh, three, about every three a week uh, to use this piece, which I did uh, in 1995. Or is it for a classroom? Uh, this was for the Time Education Program, the longest rivers and highest mountains in the world. And of course, everything that I've shown you here has in one sense or another been done before. I'm not claiming any authority about these things. I just uh, like the idea of emulating some of the most beautiful graphics that have, that have ever been done. But whatever the audience is, and the audience is really important, I think, there's one principle that I don't think we should forget, which is to be we should not be dazzled by data. Ah, data. Yes, uh, especially big data. But data, a dangerously simple four-letter word that I would always attach another four-letter word to, which is kind of a heretical thing to say because it makes data nerds freak out. But editing is not the same as simplifying. And by the way, simplify, I think, is a kind of dangerous word in itself. I, would, I much prefer the word clarify. Simplify indicates that you're dumbing something down, and I have never wanted to do that. But whether it's simplify or clarify, this quote from Hans Hoffmann, simplification means eliminating the unnecessary so that the necessary may speak. Because we need to edit data for the users we target. You can't just throw everything out there and say, here it is, you work it out. Look at this map of Tokyo. This is the subway in Tokyo. And look at what a, a good, a great, information designer did with this. This is Richard Saul Wurman's map of Tokyo for his audience. This was for a guidebook. 
This is for everybody who lives in Tokyo and might need to know every single line. But you don't know to, uh, generally need to know every single line if you are going to Tokyo as a tourist. So don't be dazzled by data and the ways that we can manipulate it these days. So remember this, and where I lived here. Well, I found this map on the web just a few years ago, a weeks ago, by Oliver O'Brien. And I thought, let's have a look at this map. This is a map that shows the dates of all the buildings in England. And I was thrilled. You know, I could actually go up to the area where I lived in Swanland. Hull, by the way, is about here that I showed you on that other map, so Swanland. And I actually found the house that I lived in here. This is the house that I lived in. Now, let's look at that color. 1983 to 1992, that was built. But it wasn't. <laughs> and this part of the village is actually pre-1900. It was wrong. The map was wrong. It was a terrible kind of... Uh, discovery for me that data, facts, could actually be wrong. And I went a little bit further into his website, and it says, the band assigned to that area is not actually very representative of the houses there. And this can be spotted by looking at the classified number. OK. This is 30% correct. <laughs> is this OK? <laughs> Don't be dazzled by data. People will check it, especially when it's online. I mean, we can do this, but do we really want to? We could do it in color. Whoa! We can put blobs on maps automatically. Look at this thing. This is a hate map of, ge of geography, the geography of hate. Uh, red is hate, so... Blue is not hate. No. Blue is slightly less hate. No hate here at all. And look, look at all these places here. This is not a map that should have been used for this application. This is a standard map that somebody's picked up and put blobs on them. I can put blobs on maps. This is actually where blueberries grow in the United States. It's, it's actually quite accurate. I, went, I, went, I took a long time to go through a lot of blueberries to find that there were less produced here than here. And we can put circles on maps. You know, the worst thing about this one from the Wall Street Journal of all places is that somebody let this be printed. Some editor looked at this and said, oh, information graphics, yeah. Let's print that, looks busy. Look. <laughs> you get very little information out of this map. Big data has the promise and the aura of precision. But too often, that very precision clouds the issue. We should edit it so that our readers can actually see the hard work that we've put into it, rather than just saying, here it all is. You work it out. I want to talk about 
three, not three, there are actually five giants of, of information graphics. You know them all, I'm sure. Harry Beck, not a designer, designed the underground map in, in London. This is what existed before Harry decided that maybe he'd have a go at, at, at redesigning it, because he heard that the uh, London Transport was looking for a way to resolve this problem, which is that the scale is enormous at the edges and very busy in the middle, this, the circle line in the middle of London here, this is very busy, and these are the out, this is the real scale, this is where it actually goes, all the subway in, in England. So Harry, who was, I, I'm on first term, name terms with him, Harry, was uh, not a designer, he was an electrical engineer. And when he heard that London Transport was, do you know all this, by the way? I, should I go through this quickly? You're not going to say, I don't know. Uh, he sketched a diagram. This was Harry's first diagram. And it's, it is not a map, it's a diagram. It's a huge thing for him to have kind of realized that all you're trying to do is to get from one place to the next. It doesn't matter about what the geography above you. And this was his first hand-drawn map. This is what he presented to uh, London Underground. And this was the first printed version of it in 1933. And here's why Beck's map is so revolutionary. Not to mention beautiful. Uh, he reinvented the scale by making it a diagram. He used color just to inform. The lines were one color. They didn't change color, which I'm sure he could have done. He could have airbrushed them or something, you know. He gave readers a context by putting in the little line that was the River Thames. It means a lot in, in, in England, in London. And most importantly, he made it updatable. This was a fantastic thing. In 1938, 33, there were eight lines. In 1949, there were 10 lines. In 1925, there were 15 lines. And it still works. This is a remarkable piece of work. Of course, designers always are going to try to do something else. So here's a hexilinear version of the London Underground. And here is a radial version of the London Underground. Personally, I don't think that Beck's work uh, could, be, could be bettered. And I don't think anybody has done it better. Other people took over from him. Paul Garbutt uh, drew it for, for, for a while. But of course, this is what designers do, don't we? We like to redesign things. Okay, the second group of giants here now. Otto Neurath, mentioned already. Marie Neurath, who married Otto. She was Marie Rademeister before, and Gerd Arntz, who was actually my favorite of the group. But Otto was the leader, and he again was not a designer. He was a social scientist from Austria. And their work, which I could go on forever about, but I'm just going to give you a very brief showing here, looked like this. Together, the three of them called themselves isotype, the inf international system of typographic picture education. Uh, here's the, how many cars are built in America and, and how they're built and how many people it takes to build them and, uh, in, in Europe. And, and, you know, nice little touches with what America looked like and what Europe looks like. I'm not quite sure why we've got one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five here, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven here. I'd have put those other two here. But, you know, he's dead. I don't want to criticize him. Of course, you know, we can't do this today. We put something in that space, right? This is Mary Barrow, the current CEO of GM. No, we can't do that. But look at this map. I mean, this is a beautiful thing. This is so clean and modern, 1939. And, I mean, I would do something like that today. It's, it, it's a beautiful thing. Or this, which is from Modern Man in the Making, his terrific book from 1939. 
uh, in which he did actually start to use a little bit more color. I, I think I prefer his black and red more, but this is a world empire. Now, National Geographic asked me to do something about wordless languages. And uh, Otto never thought that, that what he was doing was a true wordless language. He thought that his work was a helping language. And he combined words and pictures, and I learned a lot about that from him. But anyway, here is the page that, uh, the print page that I did for National Geographic, and it's really a, a selective timeline of pictorial languages from cave paintings all the way down to the Noun Project, which is a web collection of, of icons with emoticons in here. I mean, obviously there's emojis there, but I don't like emojis. The, the, I like emoticons, which were only invented in 1982, although there are references to it, to uh, uh, using um, uh, punctuation as uh, faces uh, much, very much earlier than this. But anyway, you know, and there's the famous Charles Bliss is in here and Locos. Uh, but a nice thing happened here. Uh, National Geographic said, would you like to make a little movie about this? And uh, my son, who's in the audience here, and thank you for coming, Roland, and I have done a few little movies together, so I said, you know, it's the usual thing. They're, they're not going to pay us any money, or not enough. Would you like to do it? You know, and he says, oh, well, okay, Dad. You know, no. I, I, I'm joking. He says, yeah, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. So uh, this is the movie that we did for National Geographic. And you can see how different it is, because it's a totally different medium. For more than 40,000 years, we've used pictures to leave messages for each other. We drew on cave walls, then we pressed shapes into clay tablets, we painted on tombs, and we scratched pictures on rock surfaces. Could there ever be a universally understood language of pictures? You know, with grammar and whole sentences. Between 1925 and 1945, a man called Otto no Okay. Let's skip it and go on to the next thing. Uh, my next uh, giant is uh, Herbert Bayer, like, like Otto Neurath, an, an Austrian, who produced this most beautiful World Geographic Atlas, and the hyphen in geo is not there because the line was too long. He actually meant it to be like that. This is a geographic atlas, which in today's uh, money cost $4 million to, to make, and only 30,000 were printed. And they cost a lot if you want to get one these days. They were given away free to uh, clients of the Container Corporation, who invited Herbert Bayer to make this, and it took him five years uh, to make it. It's a m wonderful mix of geography and graphics and art, and uh, again, like Neurath's work, this has a kind of modern look to it that I think is uh, a terrific example for, for us to look at. Like Neurath, he, he actually used isotype kind of ideas about how to line people up in rows, and uh, uh, so, ju just some st stunning, very simple and controlled uh, graphics. Now these five giants, I think, went way beyond their, commission, uh, their commissions. And I like this little quote from Brandon Dawes, uh, data by itself is not enough. Data needs poetry. Now, uh, none of what I've said, or have tried to say, is an argument against big data or data visualization. It's more a plea for us to consider 
which bits of data are relevant to our audiences or users, and how to design those bits for those users. As to the future of information graphics, I'm optimistic that everything is going to be all right. But as we move into what seems to me to be an all digital, all the time, all mobile environment, we face this danger, which is putting stuff out there before it's ready. Remember the house, the map of the house is in England. Well, who cares, you may say, if it's all digital, we can change it on the web, right? But we are not like Kanye West, who is apparently still tinkering with his latest album, the ridiculously titled The Life of Pablo, who is changing his words, probably as I speak, about Taylor Swift owing him sex. No because we're not dealing with another pop star or a quarrel with another pop star. We are dealing with facts. And if we don't get the facts right, we won't be trusted. And information graphics will suffer. We must think about the audience or the user and edit the data before we design it and put it out to people. So in conclusion, I think we should look back at history. A hundred years ago, Gertrude Stein said, you can be a museum or you can be modern, but you can't be both. I'm sorry, Gertie. That attitude is wrong today. All graphics were modern once, and if something is good, it'll stay that way. We should not forget to look back and borrow from history. As well as looking back, I think we should add poetry to data. Not be afraid of aesthetics or engaging our audiences or taking delight. Or we should take delight in the art of explanation. And we should do it all with passion and love what we do. I have a passion, apart from the color blue. It's cheese. So we should look back at history, poetry, and cheese. It's not quite what I meant, but here's, here's why I love cheese. I love cheese. Just love it. And I used to wonder if there was some scientific reason that could explain why. You know, some important sounding excuse I could use to account for my craving. Here's what I found. We all know that cheese is made from milk. It's basically a concentrate of protein called casein and fat. You eat cheese, mmm, yes. It goes down to the stomach. It sloshes around in the juices there, which start to digest it. And in the process, casein is transformed into casomorphin. And that's a chemical cousin of morphine, or opium. The addiction-inducing casomorphin travels up to the brain, which says, this is great stuff. Eat more of it. Well, it's as simple as that. And now I know why I love cheese. I'm addicted to it. <laughs>